1926, a group of exiled Russian anarchists in France published the pamphlet Organizational Platform of the General Union of Anarchists. The authors argue that their proposed anarchist union should adopt a principle of collective responsibility. In this paper, I take the anarchist debate produced by this pr proposal and I use it as a case study of the applicability of contemporary work on collective responsibility to political theory. The central claim of this paper is that the anti-platformist normative individualism with regards to responsibility stems from a narrow understanding of the concept of collective responsibility. In fact, some other kinds of collective responsibility are compatible with social anarchist commitments to anti-authoritarianism and non-hierarchical organization. I zoom in on the benefits uh, of an approach uh, of forward-looking collective responsibility. I will finish this presentation with some remarks on what social ontology and anarchism can perhaps learn from each other. But before I start something about me, uh, my name is Emma Mormon and I'm a PhD researcher in philosophy at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. I am involved in the project Neuroepigenetics, which is funded by the European Research Council. My supervisor and also the PI of this project is Professor Christine Hens. And I would like to thank her for giving me the opportunity to conduct the research I present here, along with my other projects. So to start the text and its context. Both the platformists and most of their critics regard themselves as social anarchists. In a short video I also made for this conference, I give a short introduction to anarchism and some core ideas of social anarchism. The publication of the platform text is part of a long-standing anarchist debate on organization. From the beginning of the move movement onwards, anarchists sought to emphasize that although anarchism wished to abolish the state and other hierarchies they deemed harmful, anarchism should not be equated with chaos. Organization and cooperation were absolutely vital if anarchists wanted to stand a chance against capitalist society and oppressors such as bosses, the state and the police. Anarchists have struggled to find and practice forms of organization that live up to their anti-hierarchical and non-authoritarian ideals. The issue of anarchy and organization was, for example, heavily debated at the 1907 International Anarchist Congress. The direct cause of the platformist discussion was the 1917 Russian Revolution. The Russian anarchists involved in the editorial group Dielo Truda were deeply disillusioned by their experiences in this revolution and the subsequent Bolshevik dictatorship. They argued that the failure of the anti-authoritarian resistance against the increasingly oppressive Bolsheviks was primarily due to their own lack of proper organization. In the intro of the platform they write, this disease of disorganization has invaded the organism of the anarchist movement like yellow fever and has plagued it for decades. The famous pamphlet itself was published in 1926. It sparked, and continues to spark, animated discussion between anarchists of all stripes. In this paper, I wish to focus on the pamphlet and some direct criticisms of it. In the general section of the pamphlet, the authors make clear that they want to start a new collective, which is dedicated to retaining an anarchist orientation and anarchist objectives in the revolution. They call this collective the General Anarchist Union. For us, the organizational section is most important because here they list four key principles of anarchist organization, collective responsibility being one of them. The principle of collective responsibility is introduced as follows. The practice of operating one's individual responsibility must be strictly condemned and rejected within the ranks of the anarchist movement. The areas of revolutionary, social and political life are profoundly collective in nature. Revolutionary public activity in those areas cannot be based upon the individual responsibility of single militants. The anarchist union 
takes a decisive stand against the tactic of unaccountable individualism and introduces the principle of collective responsibility into his ranks. The principle, hereafter referred to as PCR, states, the union as a whole is answerable for the revolutionary and political activity of each member of the union. Likewise, each of its members is answerable, answerable for the revolutionary and political activity of the union as a whole. Soon after its publication, the platform received criticism from prominent anarchists. In this paper, I focus at, on the criticism of Erico Malatesta. His direct writing style allows us to distill his claims and analyze his arguments with relative ease. According to Malatesta, the platformists do not at all know how to blend the free action of individuals with the necessity and the joy of cooperation. He is worried that it would only make sense to say that the union has a collective responsibility if it also has the means to monitor the action of the individual members and order them what to do and what not to do. And he thinks this is very problematic. Malatesta foresees problems on the side of the individuals in a collective as well. He agrees that anyone who associates and cooperates with others for a common purpose must feel the need to coordinate his actions with those of his fellow members. However, he believes that this individual moral responsibility is fundamentally different from the, propo from the proposed collective responsibility. Moral responsibility, and in our case we can talk of nothing but moral responsibility, is individual by its, by its very nature, he writes. Based on these and other criticisms, Malatesta deems the proposal typically authoritarian and even wonders what that notion of collective responsibility can ever mean from the lips of an anarchist. The platformists had expected quite some criticism, but nonetheless they were shocked by the intensity of it and the directions from which it came. Peter Arzinov replies to Malatesta's worries by giving a slightly more elaborate explanation of the PCR, as you can see here. Arzinov concludes that in categorically repu repudiating collective responsibility, Malatesta renders impossible the realization of such an organization. Makno is even more outspoken. He claims that it is through the inspiration of collective responsibility that the revolutionaries of all epochs and all schools have united their forces. Now, after some quotes, we can go on to our main analysis. I restate the main question of the debate as follows. Is the PCR compatible with social anarchism? Platformists uh, certainly think the two are compatible. Critics such as Malatesta think the two are incompatible and they reject the principle of collective responsibility exactly for that reason. But what exactly are the arguments they make to support these claims? And importantly, how can it be that anarchists who otherwise agree on many issues disagree so profoundly here? Part of the variety may have to do with the fact that responsibility language can be quite confusing at times. H.L.A. Hart famously made this point in Punishment and Responsibility, when he managed to write a one paragraph story in which the adjective responsible featured nine times, having a different meaning every time. The anarchists seem to use responsibility in multiple ways. Especially the use of responsible to designate a character trait seems rather unrelated to the main question on collective responsibility and in the text on the platform only seems to add to the confusion. More interesting is the use of responsibility in moral and non-moral senses. A key issue in the debate is whether or not collective responsibility can and should be of a purely moral nature. Maria Isidina and Malatesta claim that the only legitimate use of responsibility in an anarchist context is a moral use. Any other kinds would be too coercive. Platformists such as Arsinov claim that only moral responsibility is not enough. 
they introduce the, their PCR as a kind of responsibility that goes beyond this purely moral kind. What is interesting here, I think, is that all thinkers seem to agree that collective responsibility can never be of a moral nature. Or not of a purely moral nature, at least. And I will later come back to this issue of what kind of responsibility they might have in mind. Another point of confusion in the debate may have arisen due to an overlooking of the distinction between responsibility as answerability and accountability. The platformists condemn unaccountable individualism. In the original PCR, however, the union as a whole and each of its members are answerable for each other's political activity. This responsibility as answerability principle does not, strictly speaking, provide an answer to an objection that is based on the responsibility as accountability idea. So Malatesta's uh, criticism only adds to the confusion because he seems to focus again on responsibility as accountability. All participants in the debate make a sharp distinction between individual and collective responsibility. But in the PCR, this distinction is not very clearly expressed at all. I propose that the PCR actually consists of two principles. One about collective responsibility in the sense it is understood in scholarly literature on the subject, and one about individual responsibility. The PCR entails, firstly, that the collective is responsible for the actions of all of its members. In this sense, it is in accord with the definition of collective responsibility by Marion Smiley that associates it with a single unified agent. What the PCR also entails, however, is a prescription of individual responsibility of each member. This is clearest in Arsinov's reiteration of the principle. Each member of the union is responsible for seeing to it that his activity will not be contrary to that elaborated by all the other members. Both sub-principles can be further analyzed using a model for responsibility as a four-place relation, a model we take from Christian Neuhäuser. We can summarize both claims by asking who is responsible to whom, for what, and on the basis of which normative standard. Neuhäuser formulates the fourth question as follows. On the ground of what normative standard is their responsibility? This standard can be, for example, a moral, legal, or political one. The individual in the anarchist union is then responsible towards the whole union for acting in accordance with the tactics and ideas of the union. This individual responsibility seems based on a political standard, but it may well also be a moral one. Perhaps a good way to characterize it is to use Hart's term role responsibility. This kind of responsibility is not really coercive, but also certainly not indicative of a laissez-faire attitude. It is perfectly compatible with the statement of Malatesta himself that those who do not feel and do not practice that duty to cooperate and do no harm to the common cause, should be thrown out of the association. The collective is responsible towards all of its members on the ground of a political standard. It is important to note here that political responsibility is a more than moral kind of responsibility that is not necessarily coercive. But one question remains unanswered. What is the collectively responsible for, collective exactly responsible for? To properly answer this question, I think we need to distinguish between the backward and forward looking aspects of responsibility. And I will do so in the discussion. How does the historical anarchist debate relate to contemporary discussions on collective responsibility? Based on their condemning attitude towards the PCR, I think we can conclude that opponents of the platform can be called normative individualists. According to Smiley, normative individualists argue that collective responsibility violates principles of both individual responsibility and fairness. Critics such as Malatesta can be called anarchist normative individualists, 
because they appeal to anarchist values such as non-hierarchical organizing, anti-authoritarianism and individual freedom to ground their criticism. And they believe collective responsibility is incompatible with anarchism. But I don't think that settles the debate. I believe, together with some platformists it seems, that there are other approaches to collective responsibility that are compatible with social anarchist values. And I think a promising approach to anarchist collective responsibility opens up if we acknowledge the difference between backward and forward looking dimensions of responsibility. Discussions of backward looking responsibility tend to focus on the appropriateness of ascribing praise or blame, but forward looking responsibility, as Smiley explains, is morally salient because we think that it may help to bring about a certain <clears throat> desirable state of affairs in the world. An ascription of collective forward-looking responsibility equals a call to action. The platformist seems to have a future-oriented idea of responsibility in mind when they talk about the responsibility the collective should take for bringing the revolution to a success successful end. Forward-looking collective responsibility, or FLCR, is often invoked as a kind of remedial responsibility aimed at remedying certain harms. Climate change and colonialism are off-sided examples. But it doesn't have to be only that. As Smiley notes, FLCR can also be about ensuring moral, social, or political progress. And this seems exactly the aim of the anarchist union. An advantage of FLCR is moreover that it doesn't present us with any serious metaphysical challenges, as Smiley explains. Since FLCR is not designed to capture an agent's will, but instead to distribute moral labor, it does not require that all conditions of more individual and backward looking responsibility are fulfilled. So this would allow us to glance over passages in Magno's defense of the platform, where he speaks over a collective spirit or a collectively responsible will as metaphorical language. And then we can focus instead on what it is the anarchists wish to achieve with their union. FLCR might be ascribed to the collectives on the basis of multiple considerations. A helpful list of sources uh, is that of uh, Björnson and Brulde. They distinguish between six sources of what they call normative responsibility, and I think at least two of them can be easily retraced in the platformist arguments. First, their capacity and cost, because the platformists argue that collective responsibility is essential for a collective of a sufficient size to be capable to resist counter-revolutionary forces. And also, opposed social anarchists readily agree that it is the anarchist society that needs to be brought about and that anarchist collectives of vast numbers are best equipped to do so. Furthermore, the platformists make it quite clear that collective responsibility only applies to the collective consisting of members who voluntarily agreed to join the collective and its political line. So this is in accord with the fourth uh, source described here. Thus far, I argued that if collective responsibility is interpreted in a certain way, it might be compatible with anarchism. Surprisingly enough, at the end of his conversation with the platformists, Malatesta agrees. He concedes that their discussion on the PCR may have been mostly a question of words. And he expresses the belief that behind the linguistic differences really lie identical positions. In a sense that they all agree that there must exist accord and solidarity among the members of an association. I want to conclude with some preliminary remarks about the relevance of this subject for social ontologists. I hope this case study shows that theories and distinctions developed in social ontology are capable of elucidating discussions in anarchist political theory. But what can we learn from anarchists? Or what do I hope to learn from them? For one, I think it's interesting they want to abolish the state, because this implies that they believe modern societies are possible without a state, which in turn seems to imply that they must have ideas about how responsi responsibility distribution might function without a state or the collective responsibility often ascribed to the state. Secondly, 
while social anarchism is characterized by a firm anti-hierarchical and anti-oppressive approach towards maximizing individual autonomy, it holds that such individual flourishing is only possible in a collective context. Bakunin, for example, regards individual freedom as constituted by and in social interaction, as uh, Srisa explains. And Arsinov seems to agree on that issue with Bakunin. All wholesome initiative will always be uh, enjoy the backing of organization. The principles spelled out are not designed to stifle initiative, but to replace the fitful activity of individuals operating randomly and occasionally with the consistent and organized work of a collective body. It could not be otherwise. This project is still very much a work in progress, so many elements need to be worked out in more detail. I also want to add some analytical lenses, for example, that of the requirements of group agents. And I also want to show how platformist discussions remain relevant for the theory and practice of anarchists and other radically democratic groups worldwide. Thank you for, the, for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to the conference.